the Thoughty or Tea podcast. You know, there's a there's a big element to the to the to my story that I think is um, harder, uh, more difficult, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm talking about like my experiences sort of around my secondary school age. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess like <clears throat> I'd like I'd like to I guess understand a little bit more about your perspective on mm-hmm. um, situations that I had with, at whether I was at school um, around around my mental health mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. perhaps my more my, my harming behaviors and sort of um, ideation. Um, mm-hmm. I guess, like, was there a point at which you kind of realized that something was a bit, a bit off with me? Like, was it, was it like a one day it kind of clicked and I just didn't talk anymore and I, I, I looked really dysregulated and unhappy, or was it kind of a gradual? I think uh, this was this was a tough one because we'd always kind of um, had quite. You know, we had this little boy that, you know, would chat, talk, and um, we could kind of guide and support. And then, uh, so like I said, you almost went through this tunnel, but went through this tunnel backwards. But all of a sudden, you kind of left. We lost you. Yeah. And it was almost like that. Like an instant kind without of. Without me even realising that we'd lost you. And I thought, it's teenage years. And everybody used to say, oh, it's it's teenage years, it's hormones, it'll be fine. Whereas I've done a lot of reading and I knew that with Asperger's you could develop mental health difficulties because of high anxiety and social demands and so forth. But I thought, you know, what would have been supportive? You know, he's comes from a nice family and um, be supportive. You know, he's got people around him, he's fine, you know, he's just been a teenager. But Actually, what I didn't see was that you could not find your place. Yeah. You just did not have your place in the world. You did not know where you fitted, so you went from finding your autism diagnosis a relief to absolutely despising it and not wanting anything to do with it and moving as far away from anything like that as possible, including talking to myself and your dad and people that were close to you, you kind of shut down. Um, the first time I knew about your harming was you used to be a brilliant swimmer. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden you didn't want to go swimming. And you said it, we thought it was because of the sudden light coming through, but actually which was one of, probably one of the hardest things for me as a parent, was you were actually harming. And again, it, selfishly, I thought, it's something I've not done or I have done that's caused You're kind that. of putting and yourself as the, the blame for it. Rather than... Selfishly, yeah, probably. And I didn't quite understand self-harming. I didn't. I kind of knew that I had to let you do it. And as a parent, that goes against the grain completely because you want to protect your child mm. and make sure your child's okay. But actually, you have to just um, make sure all these supports in place and then you kind of move through it. I think that's one of the hardest things ever, really. And, um, yeah. yeah, that was difficult. Um, and then we just, um, the only support we had really was the school nurse, who was great, but school didn't really understand it. Mm. Secondary school, I'm, I'm saying, didn't understand it. So I was still doing okay um, academically, wasn't I? I was still... You were still careering ahead and that was fine as long as you were performing academically. You know, actually it's not, um, you know... <laughs> priority that you was that you were okay emotionally and that didn't seem to be a priority so there wasn't a great deal of support out there apart from CAMS and you got referred to CAMS and you would talk to your health mm. worker but you wouldn't talk to us as a family. To be honest I didn't which really say fine, much to her either. Which was fine, it's not a criticism you know you mm. had to go through that 
processed, didn't you? But I didn't find it very. There helpful. was little guidance and support as parents. There was a very little guidance and support yeah. for you as a young person. If I'm honest, it's better now. And I think if I'd have known about social care and how they could have supported at the time, maybe I would have gone down that mm. route to get you a PA or support. But um, I think there was always a stigma with social care that there isn't now that actually social care is a really positive thing to actually add support to the family, you know, and to make sure that... Um, Everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, and that there is a network around you and around the family. So, was the was the person who was supporting me? Were they autism trained? Like, did they know much about autism? No, because I training just didn't really happen at that time at all. No, no, because I just. You know, obviously, I look back with all the knowledge and the research that I've done in adult mm-hmm. life and, mm-hmm. you know, stuff around alexithymia and cognitive empathy and mm-hmm. all sorts of different things. Never, was never really touched mm-hmm. on or used in the, in the context of mm-hmm. support that I was getting because I'd come away with these mm-hmm. sheets of what to do, like, when I'm anxious or what to do when I've had low mood. And they just... They just didn't work because, like, how am I supposed to regulate my anxiety when I don't know that I'm anxious until I'm at the point where I'm having a meltdown or a panic attack? Mm. It's like, it just didn't didn't work for me. And I, I, I really felt sort of during those sessions, I, I didn't talk, talk to them very much at all, to be honest. I didn't open up about hardly anything because mm. it just kind of felt a bit, I just felt like they, they didn't really understand me. And I didn't understand me, but I, I knew that they didn't. Mm. Like, they couldn't really offer me anything that that I felt was... I don't know. I, don't, I didn't feel like that they could offer me anything that, that would help. Mm. Um, I think there's some stuff around mm. methods to, like, stop, stop with the harming behaviours, which kind of worked a little bit. But... No, it's it's kind of like one of those situations where I thought I had to kind of go to these and mm-hmm. let them know that I'm okay rather than to talk about the feelings that I was having. I think that also um, there was a lot of bullying going on at school that mm. you again didn't share. No, I didn't, I didn't. No. And actually, through your podcast, we've kind of got to know about it, and so, sometimes they're a bit heartbroken because we didn't know because. I think you didn't want to share it. So you, I mean, you've said you didn't want to share it. Did no, you? You I didn't tell anybody about it. anything. No, no. I even like my friends about the bullying and things like that. Mm. It was more like, mm. um, it was uh, it was schools should have picked up on that. Really, they should be more vigilant because of your autism. Really, the only thing that school really did that was quite helpful mm. was they allowed me to go to the to, the, um, sort of like the special needs mm. department area that they had. Mm. But they didn't do anything with me. Like they didn't mm. support me of anything. They just let me sit in there and have a meltdown. And mm. now and again, I talk to some of the teachers and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it was never something that was like proactively given to me. I had to like seek out the support from the teachers. Um, and some teachers were really bad with um, underst- understanding my, my difficulties and and. Mm allowing me to like go outside when I'm having issues with my sensory stuff and mm. those some teachers were great and some teachers were, were not so much and I remember one of the one of the issues that I had particularly around PE is that I didn't like to get changed in front of the other the other kids and so I'd always wait until the end of mm. the thing to get changed and I'd always get like told off by like the teachers when I came late to, I did not know that no I didn't know yeah, I, I, because I was so hyper vigilant about cause the, you know, as yeah. you know, the boys, yeah. boys changing rooms, they're a bit rowdy, and yeah. you know, I was in the top set of PE, so I was with like all the kind of popular football-y kids, and yeah. I was just kind of constantly aware of just like yeah. that stuff uh, up until the point where I realised that, and everyone started leaving. I was yeah. like, oh my god, I haven't got changed, and 
<laughs> I'd always get t- told off by like the PE teachers guy, come on, Tom, like, you know, you're always yeah. late. And... <laughs> no sense of urgency. <laughs> no. And I hated PE. And it's it's weird that I hated PE. I know, because cause you did so well. I know. Yeah. I think, I think taekwondo and being part of a team really turned things around for you. Yeah. Um, it was kind of a bit of a random thing, wasn't it? Trying something else to take over from the swimming. Just because I liked anime um, at that, yeah, that you time. Yeah, you went into Because your special interest has always been sort of... Um, Japanese-y. Pokemon, Yuki, yeah, yeah. Japanese. And you went to your secondary school because they did an exchange. Mm-hmm. And you actually went on the exchange, didn't you? Yeah, and to you Japan, enjoyed yeah. it. And that was amazing. It was, it was like, around the time oh, that... that, mm-hmm. that um, Fukushima incident happened, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was, passed, yeah. we were having an exchange student, uh, exchange mm-hmm. program with the mm-hmm. school in Fukushima, and it was um, it's a bit hard. It was it's a lot different to like mm-hmm. what was planned, but um, it was good. It was a good mm-hmm. experience for me. I, I, it was one of the only times that I really felt like accepted by a group for like a mm-hmm. in, in a long time, because mm-hmm. the Japanese students they were like really impressed with like my academic stuff and they were really impressed with my taekwondo i was like oh my god i just never get this like in my school and it was kind of like wow like they actually see me and they want to talk to me and it's like it was um i think that was the most that's how it should be isn't it? that was the most transformative thing for me and i was talking to um uh someone recently about like this i think i was talking to timmy about the the sort of how the American schools work versus British schools because mm. in like the American schools, like if you do well academically and you, you're good at sports, you're like instantly just the popular person. Right. Yeah. 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 Whereas in, in the in the UK it's like not like that at all. No, no, it's not so it's Oh the sometimes opposite. the opposite. Yeah. But I think you take what I mean. You tried a few kind of martial arts. Tried Aikido. And then they, yeah, you did judo. Tried you tried karate, <laughs> and then eventually taekwondo. And you just that was it. You just took to it, and um, it kind of um, the exercise and the routine and um, the formalities around it as well was good because it kind of um, helped your mental health. But then, of course, you took it too far in terms of doing too much exercise, even brushing your teeth, you'd be doing squats and kind of... Yeah, I was really obsessed with that. And also, there were certain weight categories you had to be in and lose weight for, and you lost a bit too much weight. And then, so that was a bit unhealthy, but all the... um, but you faced a lot going into competitions and so forth. I'd have like a lot of meltdowns and panic yeah, attacks meltdowns before. Meltdowns before, but then you would use mindfulness and kind of focus. And um, you were amazing. You've achieved so much, really. And yeah, you and you and, and Dad right. have been like amazing with like helping me get to like because they they're taekwondo clubs like the sport taekwondo clubs. Because I started like mm. a traditional one like around Harrogate, but yeah. then I then I think. You know, um, one of our friends kind of yeah. encouraged us to kind of go to a sports place, try it out. Yeah, they kind of headhunted did, yeah. me and, yeah. um, you know, started, started training there. We used to, like, travel back and forth after That's school. Four times a week. Yeah, so. two-hour round trip yeah. um, to train. Um, I don't know. I I felt like I kind of – I remember my secondary school as – secondary school experiences feeling kind of worthless like mm. people to really I didn't feel like people really saw me or found me interesting and mm. I I kind of I, I had like a some some kind of passion or ignition to make myself better like all the time mm-hmm. about in, in every setting that I wanted to like you know I I, I always had these goals because you know, your goals and your meaning and the reason why you do things, they're kind of separated from how you feel. Like, if you're looking to be happy all the time, it's not always something that you can do, but you can always have a goal or a meaning that you you strive to do. Um, And I think that's what Taekwondo and what the academic stuff was about. Because I was like, all right, I'm going to prove myself that I'm 
you know, I'm a, a good person. <laughs> I am good at stuff. And I, I kind of thought that, you know, when I started getting awards yeah. and medals that people would, um, I guess, want to talk to me more, mm. be more social. And that did happen within Taekwondo. Oh, um, and with the te- with the with the teachers like in the top mm-hmm. sets and stuff, but mm-hmm. not like with the kids at school. So I always just felt like every time that I went to school, it was kind of like a right. This is a task, and mm-hmm. you know, any time that I was actually in lessons or is in the library revising or mm-hmm. researching, like I felt good. But then it was the stuff around it that I just couldn't cope with, and I tried to be social now and again. Um, I got involved in different groups, but I was very much like a drifter. Like I didn't really have like a like a best friend or like someone that I could rely on or someone that I could, you know, talk to about my feelings. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I think I found really difficult. There was nobody you could really trust, was there, at that no. point in terms of talking? No. I don't think. Not friends, no. not people in my social circles mm-hmm. um it was hard it was a hard time wasn't it really hard on you and uh bittersweet with all the taekwondo and the positive things and the traveling so mm. you learned to be more independent because you were traveling to different countries and working with in thailand team, yeah working with a team and then that kind of set you up to kind of oh with taekwondo think, yeah yeah. We always kind of said, give it a go, Tom, you know, and then we did the prep around it, didn't we, and tried to kind of um, find the best way to kind mm. of um, support you to do those things, even though they're a challenge. And I think that was the good thing about you, is you would always give it a go. Well, you I mean, you, you taught me like, from a young age to give stuff um, a go, and, you know. And- we always said, have your autism in your back pocket kind of thing if you need it, but don't say I can't do it because yeah. uh, just give it a go you know if you don't want to you don't want to but just try it so if it, it feels like a lot of a lot of parents a lot of people mm. kind of go like to the two extremes mm. they're either like mm, okay. they can't do anything so we're not going to expose them to it mm. or they're like they have mm. to do everything that's expected of them and they have to do all these mm. things and if they don't do it then that's a bad thing and that they should be punished or they should be mm. you know whereas with with you you know growing up with you as my mom it was kind of like um i i was exposed to that stuff but then mm. if i needed to i i could exit mm. and it wouldn't be mm. like a an, an expectation or an issue that yeah. i couldn't cope with it I think that that that's the kind of dynamic that really works work for me because I still got the experience of it, but then I felt safe enough to exit if I. Because quite often we'll say to kids, right? If if we're going to commit to this, we're going to do it week after yeah, week. Week after week, you have to. Uh, actually, it doesn't work with older. Maybe with my younger son, it did, but not with mm. new times. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely. But I also recognise that. Some parents will really struggle with their children with autism going to activities and doing things like that because you maybe you're on your own. Maybe your child has no sense of danger and that kind of thing, and that yeah. is tricky. So I do recognise you can't always do that with your children. No, but it's it's about it's about the adjustments mm-hmm. though, isn't it? That it you is do. doing something that challenges them a little bit. Yeah. Bit by bit. So it's not so exposing that it just Mm -hmm. causes them to Mm -hmm. find life just overwhelming. Yeah, because life is life and you have to have little tasters to know that actually I know how this is going to go. So the next time I do it, whether I like it or not, I know how predictable it's going to be. And eventually I'll be able to cope with that because I know about that and that experience or that sensation and I can deal with it more so you kind of things get worse before they get better I guess and it's writing it down sometimes I hope you guys can hear me okay (laughs) (laughs) you're doing great you're doing great it's an awful voice to listen to (laughs) for an hour and a half (laughs) well um I mean going a bit further because I know we were talking about how 
it was hard to to get me support like in an ideal world mm. what would you have wanted mm. for me or what 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 do you think would have been helpful either from the school or from mental health systems mm. i would have wanted a coordinated team around you and us as a family mm. um that were trained in autism that were trained in sensory, were trained in mental health. Um, so it's not kind of one size fits all, but kind of mm. got had the chance to get to know you and, and kind of fed that back into school and into the family as well. So it was more joined up. Um, I think that would have worked better. And also, I think, which is really powerful and um uh, particularly in schools, is peer awareness. And, yes. Um, yeah. And other kids, and, you know, so you identify this child as being bullied for whatever reason and just giving them a voice or being their voice to say, actually, this is the reason why this is what you can do to help. This is what you could do to support and, and kind of turn it on its head a little bit. Mm. So... So that's, that's something else that I found uh, yeah. with my, my teaching as well. This is so powerful. When I've done in primary schools before with teachers, um, the child has always become more powerful and kind of has a voice and is able to change things because whether or not they're able to tell their story and what they find difficult, if other children are aware, then they don't... Of more uh, norm, I hate to use the word, but more normalised, and then yeah. it just becomes accepted, you know, and acceptance we can ask for ultimately, mm. really. I think it would have been really mm. good for me to have like a like an mm. like a role model that mm. was autistic that you know, like mm. when when I went mm. into into schools and seeing the seeing the other. The kids and stuff. Like, there were no programs, no films, nothing. No. There was Rain Man. Yeah. Wasn't there? And that was it. So everybody thought everybody that was autistic behaved like Rain Man. And that's just not the case. It's very stereotypical. And um, But even just, just someone someone that I could mm-hmm. who was older who, you know, was doing stuff that, mm-hmm. that I wanted Definitely. to do and had their yeah. you know, their their life like mm-hmm. sorted and their adjustments mm-hmm. sorted in, in daily life and just someone to like talk to about being autistic mm-hmm. I think would have been really helpful but mm-hmm. I think you know a lot of lot of autistic people mm-hmm. you know we just have such a hard time in life it's hard for us to get into those positions where mm-hmm. we're able to to be active role models for mm-hmm. for kids and I think it's changing overall I think it's there's... taken a while has it but mm-hmm. I think it is changing and I think um uh, I think kids are kind of looking, you know, and finding their place easier, you know, because mm. of more diversity. But it's taking a long time coming, isn't it, really? Yeah. There's so much, like, work that needs to be done for, like, preparing, mm. like, autistic kids mm. for manipulation and bullying. And mm. I don't know exactly how the best way to go about doing that is, but I think it just it definitely needs to be mm. tackled because we we know that, like, long-term anxiety in formative years mm. leads to development of depression mm. and mental it does, health. It does, it um, does. You know, it's it's something that really needs to be tackled. And I think that that bullying and social mm. isolation and the mm. sensory elements, the social elements at school, they're absolutely just it's so impactful on, like, someone's long-term mental health. Mm. You know, it's, it's something that can, you know, follow you into adult life, you know, if... Well, to find every aspect of life scary is a really... I can't imagine what that feels like, really. To just find everything and everyone and every sound and every feeling really mm. scary. Mm. Um, you're about to, it's about to have an impact, isn't it, yeah. on your mental health and your well-being. So I think it's so important that we have that, not awareness. Because awareness is just that, Sort of lip service saying, Oh, yeah, I know about autism. I've read a bit about it. Mm. It's about about doing something about it, actually being proactive and saying, Look, you know, there's a kid over there, or there's a mate over there, 
well, there's a kid over there that actually people are bullying or they're um, not being not being supported and actually just going, look, if you want to join in, you know, come and join in with us or be part of it. Mm. Or, um, our children, new people, I've just got so much to offer as friends, as children, as as colleagues, you know, and just so much to offer, really. Totally. Yeah, completely. Just in awe sometimes, really. Mm.